Good evening and welcome to Doctors on Call. I'm your host, Dr. Ray Christensen from the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth. Tonight we're talking about high blood pressure. What would you like to know about the diagnosis and treatment of blood pressure issues? Call numbers are on the bottom of your screen. Please ask away. Locally, the number is 218-788-2844 or toll free 1-877-307-8762. I'm pleased to welcome our panelists for this evening. Dr. Mitch Cardwell, a family physician with the St. Luke's Hibbing Family Medicine Clinic. Dr. Ryan Harden, a family physician with the Gateway Family Health Clinic in Sandstone. And Dr. Nancy Hassinger, a cardiologist with Essentia Health St. Mary's Heart and Vascular Center, Duluth. Our phone volunteers tonight are Carter Kittleson, from Ceylon, Minnesota, Togel Hanhan from Duluth, and Aaron Kramer from Plymouth, Minnesota. And now on to tonight's program on high blood pressure. But just a moment before I start the program, I want to take just a moment to note the passing of Dr. Ben Owens, who was a great mentor and advisor to this program and a mentor to so many of us here in the northern Minnesota area and to his beloved Hibbing, Hibbing Minnesota. We certainly will miss him. Dr. Cardwell, can you lead off the program tonight and tell us what, what is hypertension or what is high blood pressure? Well, blood pressure in general, what most patients look at and see here is the number of your systolic, which is the top number, and diastolic, which is the bottom number. Systolic blood pressure meaning the pressure that's generated when your heart pumps, and diastolic blood pressure is the pressure generated or when the heart relaxes. High blood pressure is usually considered above 140 over 80, and, that, and we have various guidelines, and there are, there are different guidelines when you're pregnant, whether you have diabetes, whether you're elderly, whether you're young, and, and we'll go into that later on in this program. But in generally, when we talk about high blood pressure, we're saying that it's a number above 140 over 80. Dr. Harden, how do, how do I know if I have high blood pressure? Well, generally, um, high blood pressure is asymptomatic. It's, it, traditionally, it's been called the silent killer because uh, people can live for years and years and years having high blood pressure, not necessarily having any symptoms associated with that. Um, so really, the only way to know if somebody has high blood pressure is to have their blood pressure checked and to find out that it's elevated. Dr. Hassinger, why, why do we need to treat high blood pressure? Why should we care? Um, yes. High blood pressure is really one of the most well-recognized risks of stroke, of heart attack, of overall heart disease, of heart failure, of kidney disease, and in combination with other risk factors that are rampant in our society and in the United States and actually the world right now, really a whole a multitude of risk factors for progression of coronary disease and all the ill health that contributes to needing to take more and more medications and more and more health issues loss of work, you know, and just loss of well-being. So we really do need to treat that to prevent long-term, we call it sequelae, or long-term complications from these years of blood pressure damage to the heart arteries and to all the arteries in the, in the body. Well, and according to the JNC-7, it's the third leading cause of death in the United States. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty important. I mean, there's about a billion people with high blood pressure, they're estimating. So. What are some of the most important sequelae that we see from hypertension? Well, chronic high blood pressure can lead to a number, th number of things. It increases the risk for atherosclerosis, which um, is a major risk factor for stroke and coronary artery disease. It can also cause um, eventually congestive heart failure if, if people have untreated high blood pressure over a long period of time. It can be, a, uh, it's one of the leading causes of chronic kidney disease. Um, stroke. Stroke. Sometimes yeah, in there absolutely. too. Nancy, how does salt intake 
affect blood pressure? It's a difficult question and you'll get a number of different attitudes and opinions in among the medical literature and certainly among your patients or neighbors or friends. There's a lot of good evidence that a high salt diet is directly associated with higher blood pressures, though a certain percentage of the population seems to be more sensitive than others. And it's hard to know if that's you or me. And in general, the American society eats just far too much salt and I think it really does contribute to our high blood pressure. So overall, you know, two grams a day or 2,000 milligrams is what's recommended. And if people really start looking at how much they eat in a day just without thinking about it, it's probably closer to four grams, 4,000 gram milligrams a day. You might want to... Or more. Or more, mm -hmm. exactly. So that's what, a teaspoon of salt? <laughs> more than that, but mm -hmm. you know, with all the hidden sources, you know, without adding, but just the hidden sources. So yeah, directly contributing to high blood pressure. It makes you retain fluid. It makes all the vessels just retain more fluid in the body, raising the blood pressure. So as long as we're there, and I like salt, so what do I have to do to curb that salt habit? Lots of good options with herbs and other spices that don't contain salt. And of course, look on the, on the grocery shelf, not for like garlic seasoning, because that's a salt product, but just pure garlic, pepper, and there's a whole bunch of products out there now that are being developed that are salt substitutes, meaning no salt, not just, not just no salt, but uh, like a potassium chloride. Mm -hmm. That's a different product. But not to mention a brand, but Mrs. Dash has got a whole lineup of different herbs that will help, ta help food taste you know, less bland. And I think importantly, learn to like what food really tastes like. Don't remember what salt tastes like. Do your clinics offer advice on diet, or is that available for our patients? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We have prevention programs yes. at all of our institutions. Dietitians are available to review that with, with p interested parties and not just patients. There are yes. prevention programs for the general public as well. There's, a, there's a, a diet that's been recommended called the DASH eating plan. DASH stands for a dietary approach to stopping hypertension. And a component of that is a low salt diet. And generally when I'm counseling patients with high blood pressure, I tell them the first thing they should do is get rid of their salt shaker, for one, to try and have a, lower, a, a diet that's lower in salt. But in addition to that, the DASH eating plan, which is a diet that's composed of lots of fruits and vegetables, uh, it's relatively low in saturated fats and, and low in dairy, um, that is generally as effective as uh, starting one medicine to help their blood pressure numbers uh, normalize. And also keeping in mind that in all of the guidelines that are ever written, dietary modification and lifestyle modification is the first, second, and third, you know, fourth and fifth things to do before starting medication. So we really have to have the patient and the, you know, the, everybody in the, with high blood pressure has to contribute their part to treating themselves. So as long as we're going down that line, what role, if any, does relaxation therapy Having help, have in helping high blood pressure? Well, there are a few people that come into your practice that have hypertension, and you can clearly re relate it to the stress of their job. And when they retire, sometimes their hypertension does go away. So stress is a big part. And it, just like some people are salt sensitive, and others may be less salt sensitive, there are others that are just as sensitive to stress and anxiety or not being able to relax in their job. So relaxation therapy does have a benefit but you also have to make sure that it's working because you and I could probably go into the same relaxation therapy. You might drop 20 points, I might drop 10. It may not be enough. I still might need medication where you may not. So relaxation therapy has, has a place, but it also has to be monitored to make sure it's effective. How about exercise? Well, exercise, uh, a regular exercise regimen, which generally consists of 30 minutes of exercise per day is is definitely associated with a decrease in blood pressure. Uh, physical inactivity is a risk factor for developing blood pressure. And I'd also like to say that beyond the benefits people will get from uh, regular exercise in terms of their blood pressure, there's benefits that um, in terms of obesity, they're, if they're diabetic, they'll have better control of their diabetes and a general sense of well-being and, and and health associated with regular exercise. And their stress level goes down. Yes, and I explained to them it's got to be aerobic. I have a lot of patients in my practice say, well, I'm busy at my job. I, I, I walk here, I do this, I do that. 
And I tell them that's start and stop, that's, a that's anaerobic. We need continuous, which is aerobic. And it's like, like he, he was saying, once you've hit that aerobic burn, it does lower your diastolic blood pressure. And f I think it's what every 45 minutes after 30 minutes of working, and if you go an hour, hour and a half, it's even longer that your diastolic blood pressure drops after aerobic activity. So you always have to qualify. The, it, moving is good, but aerobic activity is really what you're looking for to lower your blood pressure. How about weight loss? Weight loss definitely lowers blood pressure. Um, uh, obesity and physical activity, which are, uh, correlate with each other certainly, uh, are associated with high blood pressure, so weight loss will definitely benefit. As little as 10 to 20 pounds. I mean, you don't have to lose a lot. You know, there's been studies that show 10 pounds weight loss may be enough to affect your blood pressure. So. As we kind of looked at some of the non-prescription ways of treating blood pressure, what kind of medicines would you use or how, what, where do you start with your blood pressure treatment? Um, and when do you decide that you should use blood pressure medicines? Generally, if, if individuals have high blood pressure of a systolic blood pressure over 140, or a diastolic blood pressure greater than 90 and who have instituted lifestyle changes, who have instituted dietary changes, who have instituted regular exercise, who are still unable to reach the goal blood pressure, that's generally when I recommend that they start a medicine. How much um, time do you give them to do that? Generally three to six months. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of blood pressure medicines. I think it's important to try and treat more than one uh, disorder with an individual medicine, for example, there's some blood pressure medicines that help to treat anxiety. There's some blood pressure medicines that help to treat migraine headaches. There's some blood pressure medicines that can also treat uh, prostate enlargement. So we try to uh, individualize therapy to somebody so we're going to use a medicine that treats more than one condition that they might have. So the, what you're really saying is when we start blood pressure medicine, we have a several to choose from and you individually choose for each patient. Yeah, it's definitely not, not a one-size-fits-all type of thing. There's, you know, everybody who has high blood pressure is going to benefit from different medicines at different doses. So that's, that's why it's important that they go see their physician who can review their other medical issues and, and recommend the appropriate medicine. And Dr. Hassinger, you, you end up seeing our patients um, when we come up against the wall. Um, should the, do we, do we do a good job of Utilizing our medicines, do we need to do a better job? Do we, is it important to push medicines? It's important to take them? There's all these questions sure. that go along with treatment. When I see a, a patient for a hypertension consult, or if that's the only issue at hand, a lot of the time there are, have been problems with the patient not feeling like they tolerate a particular medication or a particular dose. Maybe they take it for three or four days and it doesn't seem to help the blood pressure or a month and then they, st they stop that medicine, move on to a different medicine, and they move through a number of different medicines, perhaps at too low a dose, rather than additive therapy. And again, by the time I see a patient, typically there's multiple other issues going on, and, and I'm treating heart problems in addition to the blood pressure, or just very difficult to control blood pressure problems, which takes multiple medications, sometimes at high doses. And it takes a frequent visits with the patient, drug titration so that you gradually increase these doses and assess that they tolerate, um, and then again move to these multiple medications. I, I also say that if it gets beyond three or four medications and it's still difficult to control, then other problems can be producing the high blood pressure. So there are certain uh, hormonal problems that can cause high blood pressure that need to be examined and test for that that you know family physicians primary care physicians and, and we can all do as well so those are called secondary hypertension and also I must say like you know, renal artery stenosis mm -hmm. is one that I come up against on a occasion lot. so if someone has a blood pressure of 160 over 110 and is already taking medicines <clears throat> that blood pressure is still too high and there are things that can be done for this person Sure, and yes. again, reviewing yes. those medications, yeah. what are they on, what are the doses, adding additional medications, maybe starting the uh, evaluation for other causes of their hypertension. I think one important question to always ask that patient is how much alcohol are they drinking? Yes. Because yeah. that's also a, dis a known association with high blood pressure. 
um, is alcohol use, and that's important. Well, Lori has a question for you about the use of red wine for blood pressure. <laughs> Um, well, for blood pressure, no, I'm not, not really associated with a benefit for high blood no. pressure. There's something about the flavonoids or flavonoids, if you pronounce it that in way, in the wine. grape skins. Mm -hmm. yeah. And is it even wine? Maybe even grape juice is said to have some of those same flavonoids. So maybe you don't need red wine. It's, it's good, but um, one serving for women, two for men, and for wine, that's five ounces. So it's really, you have to measure that carefully. It's not a five ounce pour. Question from Chisholm. Okay. It's your country. When is the best time of the day to take blood pressure medicines? I urinate a lot afterwards. Well, it sounds to me like they're talking about diuretics if they urinate a lot after they're taking their medication. And we try to take diuretics earlier in the day so people aren't up all night urinating. Instead, they can be up during the day when they're normally up. And as again, as we all talk about, we try to individualize our treatment to our patients. There are certain blood pressure medicines that they're probably not even going to know that they're taking. ACE inhibitors and ARBs are probably the lowest in side effects. Most people don't even know they're taking them. Beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, some people may feel dizzy when they stand up. They may be fatigued. In that case, those medications might be better taken at bedtime rather than in the morning or during the day. So it really depends on your patient, and you have to talk to your patient and make sure that whatever you're using, that they get along with it, because they're the ones that have to live with it. So I'm always worried about side effects, because if they're having one, there's a good chance they're probably not going to take their medicine. So I'm really interested in what they're feeling, so that I know they're going to stay on it. How about the very elderly? Uh, you know, we, t we check blood pressures in the office with them sitting down, and a lot of them have complaints of being dizzy and lightheaded when they're standing. Uh, are we over-treating some of these people? I think that the new recommendations that came out for uh, being less strict as to treatment of blood pressure in the elderly is probably associated with the side effects that we've seen in some elderly patients. Um, one common side effect that I see in elderly is orthostatic hypotension, which is a drop in blood pressure when people go from a sitting to a standing position. and um, especially in the elderly, it's important that that's assessed for when elderly individuals are on uh, blood pressure medicines that can cause that because um, it can cause falls and falls in the elderly can be associated with some, some sequelae. Um, so and I also think so certain blood pressure medications are a little more associated with those changes in blood pressure on standing versus laying versus sitting and especially more in more sensitive with the elderly. So. We think of alpha blockers and those kinds of class oh, yes. of medications they are a little yeah. more sensitive to. So again, individualizing with that patient. Just a quick aside, are all salts created equal, including sea salt and all of that? Back to salt. Salt <laughs> is salt, and it doesn't matter the source of the salt. It's the same molecule. It's the same thing. And, you know, sea salt is a little, it, it, you grind it, and it's a little bigger crystal of salt. And, you know, you may actually be having more of it on your food than you think and then, then regular salt because of the size of the crystal, but salt is salt. Yeah. Menopause, does menopause affect your blood pressure? Some do, some don't. Unfortunately, with menopause, there's a lot of things that are going on. Some women are blessed and they have no symptoms or problems whatsoever going through menopause, and other women are cursed, and whenever I have a woman in my practice that comes in to t discuss menopause, I make sure I clear out about a half hour to an hour because it's a long discussion because it varies. And some may have blood pressure fluctuations as their body is fluctuating and others may not know anything. What is considered too low of a blood pressure? Um, this, I've had a lot of patients ask me that question. Um, if somebody is not on blood pressure medicines and they're not having any symptoms, really no blood pressure is too low as long as they're not having symptoms. But uh, in an individual who's being treated for high blood pressure with um, blood pressure medicines, if they're having symptoms, it doesn't really matter what the blood pressure is. It's that you might be driving their blood pressure too low with the medicines that you're giving them. So it, it depends on if they're taking medicines or not. Is uh, tingling of the feet and arms, are they related to high blood pressure? I don't see for high. I mean, certainly low blood pressure if people are having evidence of what we call orthostasis, where you stand up and you feel like you're going to pass out. 
some people will describe tingling in their hands or their feet or around their lips and they're getting ready to pass out. But I don't think I've ever had anybody come in there and say my hands are tingling when my blood pressure is mm -hmm. elevated. Some people might say they have a headache or they can feel a pounding in their ear. And sometimes that's accurate for them, and, but the next person comes in may have sky-high blood pressure and they have no symptoms at all. Might it be diabetes or something? Too? It could be diabetes. It could be a symptom of something else altogether. How do ACE inhibitors work? Um, ACE inhibitors interfere with a hormonal pathway that's associated with regulating blood pressure. The, the blood pressure in our bodies is regulated by um, multiple neurological and hormonal pathways and ACE inhibitors are a commonly prescribed uh, medicine that interfere with one of the hormonal pathways that regulates blood pressure, essentially lowering blood pressure. High blood pressure that goes down after drinking wine, how does that happen? Well, initially, wine does vasodilate and relax those arteries, so immediately after drinking wine or any alcohol, any alcohol. blood pressure will fall but long-term use of alcohol is still associated with high, high blood, blood pressure and hypertension. So it's a little bit of a paradoxical uh, reaction. And if you think that taking a glass of wine every night is lowering that blood pressure immediately, it's not a lasting effect. <clears throat> is we've already said it is, but the question is congestive heart failure related to high blood pressure. Does someone want to talk about that just a little bit more or more, more than one of you? How it's related or? Is it related to high blood pressure? Well, it can be. It can be a result of high blood pressure. If somebody has uh, too high a blood pressure for, for too long of a period, the ventricle, and Dr. Hassinger would be better at explaining this, but the ventricle gets stiff and then the, it doesn't work as well. And so what happens then is you'll go into heart failure because the heart can't relax, it can't pump, it can't fill like it's supposed to. And eventually, if it's not pumping, the fluid backs up in front of the heart, and pretty soon you have swelling in your feet and your knees, and pretty soon it's in your stomach, and then you hear it in your lungs, and you're in trouble. So. Uh, appropriate <laughs> explanation. Do one of you want to talk just a brief minute about metabolic syndrome? We've touched on diabetes and hypertension. We've talked about obesity. It's something that's there. Yeah, I mean, it's all of that put together. So in, in, again, American society with our sedentary obese lifestyle, a lot of high blood pressure and high glucoses that may or may not be diagnosed, recognized, or otherwise felt. Um, there is this dysmetabolic syndrome, which puts, is a risk factor or a bunch of risk factors all put together, increasing the risk of stroke and heart attack. Um, and it's really diabetes with high blood pressure and obesity and abnormal lipids and all that put together. I don't know if you want to comment. I call it undiagnosed diabetes. Right. When, when somebody comes in with metabolic syndrome, I tell them they're a diabetic, they just don't know it yet because their waist is greater than 36 for men and I think 34 for women. They have elevated triglycerides or lipids, their blood pressure's up. They have all the risk factors to damage their heart and have a heart attack or a stroke. They just haven't had it yet. One of the questions is what are the current just to carry that on, what are the current recommendations for HDL and LDL, high-density lipoproteins and low-density lipoproteins in controlling or helping or a healthy blood pressure? Uh, another difficult question, complicated question, just because new guidelines came out in December that we're trying to wrap our hands around. Um, they took away a goal, a target, a number, and more it's trying to treat patients based on their risk. And so getting patients on at least a moderate intensity cholesterol regimen, particularly a statin medication, uh, to lower the risk of future events of particularly heart damage and heart attack. If somebody's already had stroke, heart attack, uh, stents, bypass, then we want them to be on intensive statin therapy, and there's really limited numbers and doses that they, they offer for that, but not really to a target goal anymore. Yep. The HDL is a little different. We do like to say a goal of greater than 40 for women, even 50 if possible, 40 for men, and that gets harder as we get older. So I don't know if you wanna chime in on that. No, you did a great job. I mean, we're, and, and we're really not worried so much about lipids. When somebody comes in and they have high blood pressure, diabetes, and high, hyperlipidemia, our biggest concern is their blood pressure, number one. Yeah, that has to come down. It trumps the other two diseases. Baby aspirin before bed, does this help with your high blood pressure? 
Um, I think uh, baby aspirin doesn't help to treat blood pressure, but uh, taking baby aspirin can help to decrease the risk of, of having a cardiac event like a heart attack. But uh, use of baby aspirin doesn't treat high blood pressure. Any other comments? I want to thank our panelists tonight, Dr. Mitch Cardwell, Dr. Ryan Harden, and Dr. Nancy Hassinger, and our medical students, Carter Kittleson, Toga Hanhan, and Aaron Kramer. I also would like to thank Linda Liskowitz for the many hours that she puts in in helping us put this program on at the medical school and making sure that we have panelists. Uh, she does an excellent job and is much appreciated. This is the final show of our 32nd season on the air. We hope the information you have gleaned this year was helpful for your health and your well-being. And remember, you can review all of our episodes this season online at www.wdse.org. Watch for doctors on call to come back next fall for season number 33. Thanks again for watching. Good night. Happy spring.